It was a decade of baby boomers, burning desires, and rock and roll, an era that defined a generation. Television became the exciting new way to sell the American dream for both advertisers and politicians. Pat doesn't have a mink coat. This is the story of how we were shaped. David Halberstam's The 50s, next on the History Channel. Hello, I'm Roger Mudd. Welcome to the History Channel. In September 1952, the most admired man in America showed up at a TV studio in New York and politics was turned upside down. Presidential candidate Dwight Eisenhower agreed to film several television ads created by the Madison Avenue advertising genius, Rosser Reeves. Reeves had already proven TV could sell cigarettes and toothpaste. In 1952, he was ready to sell a president. Our series, The 50s, continues with the box that transformed a nation. Television had the power to entertain and inform, and more than anything else, the power to sell. Join us now as the History Channel presents The 50s, selling the American way. Christmas Eve, night of great expectations. Night when children dream of candy canes and electric trains. This is the night when dreams come true, children's dreams, and the dreams of their parents. For on this Christmas Eve, into many homes will come a whole new world of entertainment. Super sets like this will bring to many families opportunity for greater understanding and the spirit of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. The 50s was the era when television was born. TV introduced us to new worlds, a powerful form of advertising, and a decade of unparalleled affluence. In the 50s, Americans learned new ways of buying and selling products, politicians, even foreign policy. The time being is on the run in Guatemala. We thought the American dream would conquer the world. But were we too willing to believe our own propaganda? As advertising widened our horizons, did it narrow our vision? It was the old saying, be careful what you dream. Your dreams might come true. Americans lived in the richest nation on earth. With six percent of the world's population, the U.S. was producing half of the world's goods. Yet Americans felt poor and were afraid to spend the money to buy the products they were making. It was the fear of return to the 1930s. It was the residual fear of the Great Depression. That fear uh, still existed very strongly in the post-war years and into the 50s. The power of positive thinking helped shake the old fears. 
Next to the Bible, it was America's best-selling book from 1952 to 1955. Its author, the Reverend Norman Vincent Peale, was a kind of prophet of profitability who helped Americans see the virtue of money. His book offered a simple self-help guide to selling. Faith in God can make you rich. The growth of drive-in churches, where worshipers listened to sermons from their new cars, suggested that some Americans now wanted money and God to share the same seat. For the first time, the words, In God We Trust, appeared on the American dollar bill. As making money became an American religion, businessmen tried to convince Americans that spending was not a sin. I think one of the things that happens in the early 50s is that the country is in some kind of major social, cultural, almost psychological conflict. Are these house dresses guaranteed not to shrink? No, just the 14.95. People are beginning to feel guilty because they're spending more money than they used to. Oh dear, I hadn't planned to go as high as fifteen dollars. Well, thank you anyway. You're welcome. They are living better than their parents. So there is a crisis, is an emotional crisis, as you have a generation really in conflict with itself. To the rescue came a new science of advertising, motivational research. This is the Institute for Motivational Research a place devoted to the intriguing business of finding out why people behave as they do, why they buy as they do. And this is Dr. Ernest Dichter. Welcome to our view on the Hudson. Ernest Dichter was a mysterious figure who helped advertisers understand how to reach American consumers through psychology. Listen to one of them. Uh, this is interview 87. It's one of over 300 depth interviews that we have conducted. Each one of them... Like a Madison Avenue Freud, Dichter sought to relieve the guilt Americans felt about buying. He starts telling advertisers how to build in to their slogan the idea that you are getting what you deserve. You've earned the right to have this. The early uh, Cadillac commercials, you've earned the right to sit behind the wheel of a Cadillac. Right through to the McDonald's, you deserve a break today. What a gal. What a night. What a car. Dichter's notion was to use Freudian precepts to loosen people's reluctance to spend by showing them all sorts of needs that these products, in fact, fulfilled. Maiden Form understood the foundations of the new idea. Sell women the notion that they could be what they buy. In the typical Maiden Form ad, um, you find a young woman in a very unlikely place wearing only her brassiere and a skirt. I dreamed I got a lift in my maiden form bra. She's talking about her décolleté. Can't possibly slip. What a construction job. You in some ways, breathe. this is that what awful dream you have that you wake up and you're at the Metropolitan Opera and everybody else is beautifully dressed and you're buck naked. Um, but there's something else about the notion that you can transform yourself, that it's possible to be a new person from the skin out. A girl can be anybody. Advertisers learn to pitch to the hopes, fears, and dreams of consumers. Now they look to a machine to manufacture them. Throughout the 50s, Americans bought an average of 16,000 sets a day, 5 million sets a year. I'm the only one that you love. Life could be a dream, sweetheart. Hello, hello again. Shaboom and hoping we'll meet again. Oh, life could be a dream. If only all my precious plans would come true If you would let me spend my whole life loving you Life could be a dream, sweetheart TV brought new worlds into the home. 
It changed family life and eating habits. People all over America in the uh, station breaks on the old Gillette fight of the week, for example, all run to the bathroom at the same time and flush every toilet in Montclair, New Jersey, causing uh, terrible sewer breaks. The coming of television created an obsession with watching things that ushered in a new generation of household appliances. Just as the television set gives you this kind of window image of what the world is like, so too does the front of your house, the picture window on the ranch house in Levittown. So too does the washing machine, so that you can peek in and watch the clothes go around. Shaboom, shaboom. All of a sudden, you can peek in the oven and watch your cake rise. It showed people lifestyles, products, um, imaginary visions of what the world could be like on a, on a daily basis and made people avid to live a different kind of life. Here's a young lady who lives in a world of enchantment all her own. Its boosters sold TV as a glorious dream machine. My beer is my golden dry beer. But for America's advertisers, the dreams were strictly commercial. To keep your place on the dealer's shelves and in the customer's minds, you must hit a lot of people with impressions that make them feel. The medium that does this is television. Our report details how advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, that television puts into every living room a selling machine. Weed the garden, cut the grass, paint the window, fix the glass, trim the shrubbery, grind the axe, but take it easy, dear. Relax. Oh, Advertisers sensed that TV was a direct pipeline from seller to consumer. Said one ad man, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Black label beer on hand. Mabel, black label, Darling black label beer. Television was so new that some people would watch anything. Uh, that one of our executives at NBC said if he could only get it on the air, the most successful program we could ever show would be a green baize table and a hand rolling a pair of dice over and over and over. People would watch and bet on that. The early TV ads were primitive, but they packed an unexpected wallop. I had the responsibility for bringing the green giant to television. The more fluid the movement, the more it cost, and I guess we were trying to save money. So we ended up with this commercial where we had this lurching green giant. And then I had this bright idea of what, what do you identify with giants? Well, fee fi fo fum And it went on the air once, and the phones rang off the hook at Green Giant in LeSueur, Minnesota, with mother saying, get him off, he scared my kids, don't ever show him again. In 1949, TV advertisers spent $12 million on television. By 1955, it was over $1 billion, and CBS had become the largest advertising medium in the world. The ads seemed to be working, as American consumers fueled an economic boom and felt better and better about wanting more and more. x lax the laxity that helps you towards your normal regularity gently overnight, and Heart Mountain, the pet product for happier, healthier pets, proudly present Queen for Today, the Cinderella show, Starring Mr. Jack Bailey. Thank you very much. New TV shows reflected the wonder over the country's sudden affluence. In America, anyone could be queen for a day. What would you like if you queen for a day? I would like to have a vacation, which I haven't had, because I had two handicapped sons. Queen for a day offered cash and appliances to the woman who had suffered the most. How can we help 
John. Well, he needs a wheelchair and he needs a special bike for exercising. The volume of the studio applause determined the winner. Number one. The deeper the misfortune, the bigger the payoff. Number four. Number one. Number one is Mrs. Viva Burt. I found you Queen Viva. Queen for a day. Queen Viva Here it is, a, a total stroke of luck. You're going to be the one that gets all the wonderful consumer appliances. It's just great. Um, it's just like the act of turning on the television. Something wonderful's going to happen. In most countries, early TV was meant for education and supported by the government. In the United States, TV was always a business. And in the early years, sponsors tried to assume a degree of control over programs that seemed increasingly sinister. The John Cameron Swayze news program was called the Camel News Caravan for Camel Cigarettes. And in the control room, every night, just before the program went on the air, the account executive would appear carrying a carton of Camel Cigarettes. And everybody who had Chesterfields or Lucky Strikes had them picked up and replaced by Camels. The allure of ads worried critics who feared that we were being seduced into buying products by people who knew how to manipulate our basic desires. Have one with me, have a Marlboro cigarette. Vance Packard's best selling book, The Hidden Persuaders, convinced many Americans that their thoughts were being controlled by mysterious forces. He asked a telling question. When you're manipulating, where do you stop? You've got no right to be in this house. I'm going to give you just 10 seconds to get out of here. Daddy? It's true, Daddy. I did volunteer for farm work. Linda, why? The party convinced me that I should free myself of the lingering bourgeois influence of family life. I'm ready. In the midst of the Cold War, Americans were terrified that they might fall victim to the brainwashing experiments of the communists. During the Korean War, tales of hypnotized American prisoners seemed to be proof that the human mind could be reprogrammed by outside forces. To early critics, TV advertising was a capitalist version of brainwashing. In this instructional film, the NBC network pitched radio advertisers on how to use the new power of television. You, the advertiser, know that more and more selling must be done in the minds of customers before they get to the store. The NBC film takes the advertiser inside the mind's eye of an average woman. Her brain is a black and white world of cluttered newsprint impressions. Then television arrives. The clutter is swept away, leaving her helpless before the hypnotizing power of the new selling machine. This is the wonderful wet strength you get in Scotty's. So next time you shop, get the family size and several vanity size boxes of Scotty's. New Scotty's. The great castles of capitalist mind control were the skyscrapers on Madison Avenue. Here were the best and brightest of American society, intellectuals practicing a new science. They exerted a peculiar fascination on the public imagination. Americans wanted to know more about the people behind the curtain, the men who turned the dials and controlled their minds, the ad men. Mr. Victor, Mr. Norman, you've just seen me do a disgusting thing. But you'll always remember what I just did. The Hucksters was part of a new trend in fiction. Advertising men became the new heroes or anti-heroes of American life. Why do we outsell them? Because we out-advertise them, right? Right. 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 
Example. Beauty soap, beauty soap, beauty soap. Repeat it, it comes out of their ears. Repeat it till they say it in their sleep. Irritate him, Mr. Norman. Irritate, 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 Anderson, 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 Anderson. With most headaches, pain mounts up. You feel dull, depressed. Tension puts nerves on edge. The creator of this Anison ad was one of the founding fathers of TV advertising, Rosser Reeves. In his ads and in his life, he celebrated the joys of buying and selling with an unbridled enthusiasm that marked the spirit of the decade. Who is the man behind the sandpaper mask? It's Triple Threat Man, Frank Gifford. Backfield the motto of Rosser Reeves was, show the product, keep the message simple, get the viewer's attention. He was a man who never overestimated the intelligence of ordinary people. He liked to hit you like a jackhammer with repetition and repetition and repetition. To relieve pain fast, help overcome depression fast, relax tension fast. For incredibly fast relief, or fast, fast, fast relief. It was probably the most hated ad in the, hist in the early history of advertising, and it was stunningly successful. I think it tripled the Addison business in an 18-month period or, or something like that. It was really quite remarkable. So he was a primitive. Rosser had just an absolutely insightful understanding of television and what it could do. He decided to create a picture. Doctors know for how Anderson relieved pain, and that's still talked about as a hammers in the head campaign. Tension puts nerves on edge. He used this this old story about the farmer with a sick mule who calls the veterinarian. The veterinarian looks at the mule for a few minutes, picks up a two by four, and hits the mule right in the center of the head. And the farmer said, "I had you to cure him, not to kill him." And the vet says, "Yeah, but first I got to get his attention." This is a high-powered hunting rifle. At the trigger, champion Doc Barth. Target, solid oak. Bullet, a big ballpoint pen. Will it still write? Big. Rosser Reeves was a man of naked ambition and hidden dreams. Like many ad men of the time, he saw himself as an intellectual practicing a new science. While he made himself a fortune writing jingles and slogans, he spent his off hours writing spiritual novels and poems about the apocalypse. The curious end of restless man, who for a second of galactic time floated upon a speck of cosmic dust around a minor sun. The spirit moved Rosser Reeves, but so did the sound of money. The son of a minister, he didn't have much money growing up. As an adult, he evolved a simple philosophy. The key to making money was to spend it. He said, now what I want you to do is to go out and get yourself deeply in debt. Now, I had come from the chemical bank, and that wasn't anything we taught anybody. And I said, deeply in debt? Rosser, what do you mean? He said, buy everything you've ever wanted. Buy yourself a new car. Buy yourself furniture. Buy your wife jewelry. And I said, why should I do that, Rosser? And he said, because when you get so hopelessly in debt, you will work so very hard that you will become a success in our industry. I know I'd go from rags to riches If you would only say you care In Jamaica, Reeves built himself a palace at Half Moon Bay, attended by 26 servants, and a butler on call 24 hours a day. Rosser came after me to do a history of the Bates Agency. I said, Rosser, why do you want this so much? And he said to me, Martin, he said, I'm going to be 50. I'm going to retire soon. I'm going to go back to my place at Half Moon in Jamaica. I'm going to be stretched out on a chaise long beside the swimming pool. I'm going to be looking out over the bay. I'm going to have a sip of a Tom Collins. I'm going to reach out my hand for a book. I want it to be a book about me. You're watching one of the world's great golfers at the Memphis Country Club. It's Dr. Kerry Middlecoff, National Open Champion. Hi, Kerry. That was a great round. Thanks, Jack. Jerry, I noticed you smoked those Viceroys of yours all through the match. I always do, Jack. I get a lot of pleasure out of Viceroys. 
Rosser was not cursed with any strong social conscience. If he could appear to have doctors endorsing a product like cigarettes, which in retrospect is just horrible, didn't bother Rosser. So join Dr. Kerry Middlecoff and discover the smoothest taste in smoking. It's the Viceroy taste. Smoother, 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 Viceroy. Smoother taste, cause Viceroy has twice as many filters as the other two leading filter cigarettes. The aim of being in business was to make money. It wasn't to make friends, it wasn't to charm people, it wasn't to entertain the world, it was to make money. And the way you made money in the advertising business is by convincing the client that your ad sold his product. Now this was tricky to do because it's very difficult to prove that an ad sells a product. Um, and as a matter of fact, Rossick said that the modern advertising man's problem, the client walks in and throws two newly minted silver dollars on his desk and says, mine is the one on the left, you prove it's better. I'm a peanut. Ranched in milk chocolate. M&M's milk chocolate melts in your mouth, not in your hand. Simplify, oversimplify the claim. That didn't matter. But focus on one claim for your product. And he did that with great success. There was nothing subtle about him. And he took that to politics in 1951 and 52, selling Dwight D. Eisenhower. The 1952 presidential campaign pitted General Dwight D. Eisenhower, known as Ike, against Adlai Stevenson, who had a reputation as a magnificent speechmaker. Fearful that the shy general would not go over well with the public, Ike's handlers turned to Rosser Reeves. Reeves wanted to sell Ike through a series of TV spots, something that had never been done before in a national campaign. Because the idea was so new, Reeves was making up the rules as he went along, and while Ike, the distinguished war hero, tried to put the best face on it, he was terrified of putting himself in the hands of an ad man. You remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inaugural address? People only remember one thing in it. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. There in the middle of an inaugural address was a five-second spot, and that's all people remember. So I simply decided that if that was what democracy is all about, why not tell more people? Eisenhower answers America. He wrote 28 question and answer spots for Ike. Reeves wanted to shoot the answers first, then find the questions. Can that be true when America is billions in debt, when prices have doubled, when taxes break our backs, and we are still fighting in Korea? It's tragic, and it's time for a change. Reeves wanted Ike to look strong so he wouldn't let him wear glasses. Unfortunately, that made it hard to see the cue cards. For each answer, Reeves had Ike look down toward the left of frame as if listening to questions. Then Ike turned slightly to read the huge cue cards. For the finish, Reeves told Ike to turn to the camera. We are going to bring them down, and here's how. When all the answers were in the can, Reeves went searching for average Americans to ask the questions. He grabbed tourists outside of Radio City Music Hall and pulled them into the studio. Reeves told them to look up and to the right of frame. They didn't know it, but the angle of their gaze would further inflate Ike's stature. The Democrats have made mistakes, but aren't their intentions good? Well, if the driver of your school bus runs into a truck, hits a lamppost, drives into a ditch, you don't say his intentions are good, you get a new bus driver. It was hours, I think it was four hours or something like that, that Eisenhower was in the studio, Reeves producing uh, new scripts constantly in the background, passing them to Milton Eisenhower, who would vet them for suitability and then give them to his brother, who was to take them as they came in. And Eisenhower would get more and more upset about some of it. Uh, and finally, Reeves remembered Eisenhower shaking his head and saying to think that an old soldier would come to this. While the old general was selling himself like aspirin, his running mate, Richard Nixon, was accused of selling out to a Republican slush fund. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Richard Nixon, my fellow Americans, I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice presidency and as a man whose honesty and, and integrity has been questioned. I am going at this time to give to this television audience a complete financial history. Everything I've earned, everything I've spent, everything I owe. 
In the presidential campaign of 1952, a scandal surfaced over money given to Nixon by a group of California businessmen. Instead of supporting Nixon, Eisenhower started to look for a replacement. When Nixon heard about Ike's plans, he didn't go to the press. He did something unheard of at the time. Nixon's instinct was, well, we don't need the printed press as a connecting link between us and the people. We can go over their heads through the use of television. So it is a quantum leap in political manipulation. Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat. And I always tell her that she'd look good in anything. Nixon's wife, Pat, was mortified by the way her husband revealed their financial situation. But the presentation convinced millions of Americans that Pat and Dick were a typical American couple just like them. Nixon used that popular sentiment to force Eisenhower's hand. Because I am not a quitter. But the decision, my friends, is not mine. I would do nothing that would harm the possibilities of Dwight Eisenhower to become president of the United States. And for that reason, I am submitting to the Republican National Committee tonight through this television broadcast the decision which it is theirs to make. I have been a warrior, and I like courage. And tonight I saw an example of courage. All those in favor of Nixon continuing as a candidate will say aye. Popular opinion forced Ike to embrace Nixon, but despite Ike's public displays, he never trusted Nixon again. And Nixon never forgave Ike for his lack of support. The two men virtually hated each other. But to the television watchers of America, they looked unified, a Republican dream team. The great winner was television, which became mandatory from then on when they went out campaigning. If the print press wasn't there to cover him and ready to get in the buses, Nixon's instinct was, well, let's go anyway, screw him. We don't need them anymore because that's where the political arena was now increasingly going to be focused. Nixon's speech also conveyed a more subtle message. Maybe it was time that average Americans shouldn't have to feel so guilty about a few frills or, in Nixon's case, a gift of a little dog named Checkers. You know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. How much is that dog in the window? <coughs> the one with the waggly tail. Between Eisenhower's ads and Nixon's performance, TV helped push the Republicans to a landslide victory. It was the beginning of a profound change in the American political process, a change that would echo throughout the world. Political parties declined in influence as the message of politicians became less important than the shaping of their image. Politics became casting. I mean, you were trying to make your candidates look as good as you could and sound as intelligent as possible, and they were being packaged through television, which you could never do before. I mean, television packaged politicians and that had bound to have an effect on politics. Nine thirty in Lima, Peru, and time for Coca Cola's popular radio show. <laughs> In the post-war era, the United States poured foreign aid into Europe and Asia and flooded overseas markets with American products and popular culture. Critics called it sentimental imperialism. See the pyramids along the Nile Watch the sunrise on a tropic island But just remember, darling, all America's economic might was backed by an awesome military power at the service of a Cold War crusade to fight communism. It was a strange mixture of good works and ruthless power politics. 
In 1953, a new branch of the American government called the CIA staged a covert coup in Iran to protect oil interests. You belong to me. In the United States, Eisenhower needed voters to support his foreign policy. Using marketing techniques learned in the campaign, his administration packaged the ruthless tactics of the Cold War as a goodwill mission for democracy. There was little truth in advertising. Fighting ends in Guatemala. These rebel troops, backed by air power, have compelled the ousting of Guatemala's pro-communist regime and have won a ceasefire from... This is the story that most Americans heard. In fact, it was raw fiction. An imaginary revolution invented by the Eisenhower administration. The truth was that the U.S. government had staged a coup of a democratically elected government to protect U.S. economic interests. There was economic imperialism done covertly under the name of democracy and anti-communism, done by the CIA with the American press kept out in a way that would make it look like it was something very different. One of the key operatives in this elaborate cover story was an ex-marine named Phil Redinger. I was called over to the Latin American branch and one of my friends was over there and he said, say, we've got a job for you. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, we want you to uh, take over the government of Guatemala. Of course, I've been hearing about this, but I said, well, what, what do you, I, this is out of my activity. He said, well, listen, you're a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps and you could do anything. <laughs> you know that, don't you? <laughs> Nobody in the government ever thought that Guatemala was any threat to the United States. What they were the threat to was the United Fruit Company. That's the only reason. The only reason in the world. Work all night and I drink a rum. Daylight come and we want go home. Stack banana till the morning come. Daylight come and we want go home. Come, Mr. Tallyman, tally me banana. United Fruit was known as the octopus for the way it held Guatemala in its grip. The octopus controlled 40,000 jobs. It owned half the country's arable land. Almost all the country's railroad tracks belonged to United Fruit. In 1952, Guatemalan workers toiled for 50 cents a day. United Fruit reported an annual profit of $65 million, twice the total revenue of the Guatemalan government. A beautiful bunch, a ripe banana. Fifty ships, known as the Great White Fleet, hauled the bananas away to American supermarkets. They were sold under the brand name of Chiquita. The man who ran United Fruit was Sam Zamure, whose nickname was Sam the Banana Man. In 1952, Sam was not happy. A new government in Guatemala wanted some of Sam's bananas. To improve social conditions, Guatemala forced United Fruit to sell back part of its land, then gave it in parcels to 100,000 peasants. It was the brainchild of an idealistic president, Jacobo Arbenz, who thought land reform would save his country. He might as well have declared war on the United States. In the Eisenhower administration, the Secretary and Undersecretary of State, the head of the CIA, and the UN ambassador all had ties to the United Fruit Company. The Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, was a fanatical anti-communist who saw the Cold War as a biblical struggle between good and evil. Foster's brother, Alan Dulles, ran the CIA. It was a very convenient relationship, avoiding unnecessary debates about policy. Foster Dulles, with his own sort of Presbyterian belief in the rectitude of himself and the United States and our way was the best, and his brother, Alan Dulles, infinitely more likable, more charming, more graceful, a great flirt. He loved the parties, and it seemed to be a reassurance when he was there. 
the right kind of people were doing it and they weren't going to do anything that the good people of America didn't approve of. In the matter of Guatemala, the Dulles brothers hatched a plan to topple the Arbenz government while creating a cover story to hide American involvement. What the Eisenhower administration wanted, if at all possible, was to pretend that it was the Guatemalan themselves who had done it. It's so good for propaganda. The Guatemalan people rising up against the communist tyranny. Where is the communist tyranny if the United States has to invade to overthrow Arbenz? It's much better if it is the Guatemalan people. To create the illusion of a popular uprising against Arbenz, the CIA needed to find someone to lead the newly invented rebellion. The man they cast in the role was Castillo Armas. I looked at this guy, this little guy, kind of, kind of uh, nervous little fellow, and I told him, is that the guy? And he said, yes, that's him. We're going to make him president of Guatemala. I said, oh my God, come on now, this is ridiculous. We're going to spend all this money to put this guy as president of Guatemala? What we had, he was the only guy we had. With a leader in place, it was up to Redinger to train the rebel army. The troops mustered on a united fruit plantation. The force that went into Guatemala to, to take over was a very, very small force. It wasn't more than 20 or 30 people. I had to, uh, to help train these guys. Of course, we, we armed them, and we took them out on the firing range and, and did that. Very, very primitive training. It wasn't anything fancy at all. What we tried to do more than anything else is imbue them with, with the idea of, of taking over their country. And they, some of them were pretty excited about it. And some of them were not too excited about it at all. They didn't want to get shot. While field agents set about scripting the revolution, Alan Dulles worried about the American press coverage. He wanted good reviews and no mention of any American role. Luckily for Dulles, United Fruit had been hard at work spinning the story. United Fruit hired Ed Bernays, a public relations expert, to sell the American public on the dangers of communism in Guatemala. Bernays put together expensive junkets for the reporters. You script the tour. You invite in a dozen reporters, uh, people with not much connection, not much knowledge, no knowledge of the language or the background. And you go here, you see the good works, here's the hospital we do, let's go see a typical worker in his home. And it worked by and large. There were an awful lot of newspapers in America who weren't going to send reporters to cover Guatemala unless it was all paid for by United Fruit. So it played to the laziness of the press. When the reporters returned home, they repaid United Fruit's kindness with just the kind of stories the company wanted to see. Only one journalist bucked the official line, the New York Times correspondent in Mexico, Sidney Grusin. You only had to look. Nothing was hidden very much. You know, you could go outside the main city and see the training, you could see the troops that we had bought, you could see the old airplanes that we had given them. And there was in, there's something in the air in a town like Guatemala City when the thing is bubbling and you just know something is going to happen. Grusin wrote about the secret U.S. mission and the success of Arbenz's land reforms. Furious, Alan Dulles arranged a luncheon with an old Princeton classmate, the business manager of the New York Times. Julius Ox Adler goes down to see Alan Dulles, and Alan Dulles convinces him, and it doesn't take much convincing, that Sidney Grusin is something of a security risk and should be kept out of Guatemala at this critical time when the coup is about to happen. I think they either hinted or said outright that they thought I was a communist sympathizer, if not a communist. Taking the CIA at its word, the New York Times cabled Grusin and ordered him to cover the Guatemala story from Mexico City. The quiet covert assault by the head of the CIA upon the reputation and credibility of an excellent reporter and the knowledge eventually that it had been a red herring. The Grusin had been red-baited. Um, 
meant that it would be less likely to be successful in the future. John Kennedy once tried to ice me out of Vietnam, and you, the Times had been inoculated and, and wouldn't and wouldn't do it. I mean, Sydney, Sydney got moved out of a story as I did not get moved out of a story uh, eight or nine years later. On June 15, 1954, Eisenhower gave the Dulles brothers the go-ahead for the coup. Three days later, the CIA brought Castillo Armas to the staging area. We took him out to where the troops were, and I said, now here they are, you lead them up there. <laughs> but it was really a, a pitiful force that went up there. They had a hell of a time, of course. They ran into all kind of trouble. At the very first sign of resistance from government forces, the rebel army turned tail and fled back to Honduras. Afraid the ragtag rebel army might be destroyed, the CIA ordered Castillo Armas to camp six miles inside the border and wait for further instructions. Meanwhile at the UN, U.S. Ambassador and United Fruit stockholder Henry Cabot Lodge tried to put events into perspective. Because it is certainly true that the United States has no connection whatever with what is taking place. The information available to the United States it thus far strongly suggests that the situation does not involve aggression, but is a revolt of Guatemalans against Guatemalans. On June 26th, Eisenhower agreed to supply the rebels with American planes and pilots. When one pilot accidentally dropped a few bombs on neighboring Honduras, the CIA hastily wrote a cover story blaming the incident on the Arbenz government. Responsible. Reporters are flown in for a first-hand look at the results. A few small holes in the airfield caused by bombs that didn't explode. Nevertheless, their falling stirs up strong resentment in Honduras over an unwarranted air attack. In the capital city, the CIA broadcast a fictional account of the rebel advance. While the American embassy played battle sounds from huge speakers on its roof, American planes swooped past the National Palace. On June 27th, Arbenz stepped down. He realized when, when he started flying American planes over the city and bombing it, he said he knew the Americans were involved and there's no way that I can win this one. I'm sure he thought that. Meanwhile, the problems of correspondents who covered the brief revolt are graphically shown too. The situation firmly in hand, the CIA let the American media in to cover the story. And the story is good. Communism for the time being is on the run in Guatemala. Castillo Armas was installed as president, knowing he had the full support of the United States and the United Fruit Company. President Armas presents the chief executive with a presidential seal worked by nuns in a Guatemalan convent. The president, as he admires... The, the president was just tickled pink by the thing went. It was very inexpensive, very inexpensive. <laughs> and we, we lost none of our people and uh, lost very few of anybody. The U.S. and United Fruit were pleased with the budget price of the coup, but the ultimate cost to Guatemala was very high. A few months after the coup, seven leading labor organizers were mysteriously murdered, and all of the unions were banned. The cost for Guatemala is, one, the best government in the history of Guatemala was overthrown. All the reforms are eradicated. The 100,000 peasants lost their land. Then, what the United States did was to strengthen the Guatemalan army and created a Frankenstein that has ruled Guatemala together with the Guatemalan upper class ever since then and which is responsible for the slaughter of about 150,000 Guatemalans for making of the Guatemala the worst human rights case in the hemisphere. Now the village mission bells are softly ringing If you listen with your heart you'll hear them singing Vaya con Dios my
United Fruit saw profits rise once more while Americans remained largely unaware of the secret subversion of their own democratic principles. The supply of bananas had not been interrupted. So now that you've seen where bananas come from before they reach your table, our journey to banana land is ended. We hope you enjoyed the trip. We know you like bananas. Our sins were that we crushed a very small country. And in so doing, we learned bad lessons which would come back to haunt us in some ways in Cuba. And I think in Vietnam as well. One year after the Guatemala coup, the United States began funding an anti-communist government in South Vietnam. Back home, few Americans paid attention to Guatemala or Vietnam. There were other things to occupy their minds. In 1955, new phrases entered the American language. Automated, church key, cue card, demolition derby, rock and roll, UFO, cleavage. Hunkies, hunkies, pieces fight. That same year, the country caught Davy Crockett fever, as kids who loved the TV show bought $100 million worth of coonskin caps and fringe leather jackets. The American public would not become aware of their secret government until the 1960s, when a failed invasion of Cuba known as the Bay of Pigs and a growing involvement in Vietnam led many Americans to question whether their leaders were... During the coup in Guatemala, ousted President Jacobo Arbenz escaped to Cuba, then moved to Mexico, where he died in 1971. His body was finally returned home in 1995, when Arbenz was reburied with full military honors. Now here's a look at our next episode of the 50s. The American family, our perception is of stable marriages and happy homes, but the family foundation was already showing some cracks.